So I'm just going to cover like the five most egregious things that the AFL-CIO um, feels about the um, Trans-Pacific Partnership. First and foremost, fast track for TPP will make it easier for corporations to send American jobs overseas and will undermine our wages by forcing Americans to compete with Vietnamese workers making 50 cents an hour. Workers in Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, and Mexico do not have adequate rights in the workplace. This drives down wages. Some are subject to arrest or even violence if they simply advocate for, for a union. TPP closely resembles the Korean Free Trade Agreement negotiated two years ago, which has increased our de trade deficit with South Korea by 50% and cost 60,000 U.S. jobs. And U.S. trade deals have consistently made it easier for U.S. companies to move overseas or offshore jobs where they can abuse workers and the environment. That's just the first point. Number two, Fast Track and TPP put our health at risk by allowing unregulated food products into our country, such as seafood from Malaysia, where contaminants are banned and toxic chemicals have been found in seafood. Under TPP, we could not hold these imported foods to U.S. safety and standards. Powerful examples of unsafe imports under TPP are seafood products from Malaysia, which uses chemicals that are banned here, and Vietnamese shrimp that are farmed in pools of waste. Fast track authority gives the president too much power by forcing Congress to take an up or down vote on TPP without making any amendments or changes. Instead, Congress should meet its constitutional duty to carefully review TPP and make changes if necessary to protect American workers and consumers. Congress shouldn't be forced to take a take it or leave it decision with 90 days on a 29 chapter 1,000 page agreement. And number four, any of the president's good intentions will be undermined by big corporations exploiting TPP. President Obama may believe this trade agreement will grow our economy, but we have tried this approach before and it hasn't worked. Big corporations will take advantage of the deal to send more jobs overseas, take advantage of low wages and weaken environmental rules. And finally, TPP is a deal with countries that violate human rights. We shouldn't make a trade agreements with countries like Brunei, one of the countries in the TPP, that abuse human rights and oppress religious mi minorities. Brunei practices Islamic Sharia law, where single mothers and gay people can be publicly flogged and Christians can be whipped to death. There's a strong potential for importing clothes made by slave labor or child labor in Vietnamese sweatshops, and frankly, we shouldn't be buying that kind of stuff. So I'm Anna again from UMass Amherst. We're going to talk a little bit about um, student involvement in this and the Road the Challenge. My name is Hannah. I'm also a student at UMass Amherst, um, and I'm a student representative on the National Steering Committee for the Real Food Challenge. So the Real Food Challenge is a national student movement working to build a more just and sustainable food system. Through leveraging the po purchasing power of our institutions, we're investing in a food system that truly nourishes producers, consumers, communities, and the earth. Young people today are leading the food movement. In the Real Food Challenge, we're part of a network of thousands of students on hundreds of campuses across the country. We're concerned about fast track because free trade agreements like the TPP threaten the food system we're working to build and the future that we're responsible for. So local food um, is one of the key pieces of creating a healthy and resilient food system. It supports small farmers, it strengthens communities and local economies. Um, so free trade agreements can, um, oh my gosh, in free trade agreements, programs that support local food can be deemed as barriers to trade because they give preference to local producers and economies rather than the global supply chain of multinational corporations. There's been really important efforts in the last decade, such as farm to school programs that reach six million students in 50 states and citywide local procurement policies. These are trends that have been growing across the country. The TPP could threaten all of these important initiatives. So free trade has had, uh, free trade agreements um, have had enormous impacts on our global food system. We know this from what we saw with the North American Free Trade Agreement, um, the most comparable free trade agreement to the TPP. After the implementation of NAFTA, cheap U.S. corn flooded Mexico's markets and displaced small farmers. Two million Mexican farmers have been forced to leave their farms since NAFTA was introduced. This has also impacted small farmers in the U.S., who have struggled to compete with the influx of cheap food imports from Mexico. Approximately 170,000 small U.S. family farms have gone under since NAFTA went into effect. 
We're concerned about similar effects on small farms, both locally and abroad, with the proposed free trade agreements that could be fast-tracked through Congress. So these negotiations are happening behind closed doors. The public is very intentionally being included from this process. Fast Track and the TPP in general is designed to favor powerful multinational corporations, not communities, farmers, workers, or students. That is why we are standing with our partners across the food movement, from the Food Chain Workers Alliance to the National Family Farm Coalition, to say no to Fast Track and to continue fighting for a just and sustainable food system. I work on fighting to protect and expand democracy here in the United States. In addition to what's already been said, I, I want to address the concerns that come out of the threat that TPP and Fast Track pose to democracy both here in the United States and in other uh, countries around the world. This is a charter for corporate rule over us. This is a charter for subverting democracy. And I'm going to address four key threats uh, to democracy coming out of this Trans-Pacific Partnership. Trans-Pacific uh, Trans Partnership. Uh, one, number one, uh, corporations, multinational corporations, are going to be able via TPP uh, to subvert the laws of sovereign nations, including uh, the United States, when it comes to protecting our environment, protecting worker rights, protecting our health, protecting our communities. All of these laws are now going to be under threat because a corporation can come in via TPP and claim that one or more of these laws is undermining their ability to make a profit. In fact, the ability to sue uh, over uh, these, these sovereign nation's laws uh, can be done on the basis of what would be future profits that the corporations uh, claim uh, to have. So via investor state tribunals that get set up uh, via TPP, effectively there is el we're elevating corporations to nationhood. We are giving them the same power that sovereign nations have. And these investor state tribunals will be used uh, to effectively bypass the democratic processes of the United States and of other nations and to allow uh, these tribunals that are uh, predominated by, by corporate attorneys to make decisions that ultimately will favor corporations over us. That's, that's threat number one. The threat number two is that this TPP is a product of big money and corporate dominance over our government and over our politics. The interests that want the TPP are the big corporations, the billionaires, the moneyed interests. And this is yet another example of the threat posed by the Citizens United ruling five years ago by the United States Supreme Court equating corporations with people and the threat posed by our big money dominated political system when what is really at stake here is whether or not we are a nation of we the people or we the corporations and big money interests. And those who want the TPP are effectively wanting to move us toward a plutocracy, toward a plutocracy that, that does away with the vision of democracy of one person, one vote, and political equality for all. The third threat is that this is, as Brian said, an unconstitutional delegation of Congress's authority to engage in regulating commerce among nations. The TPP and Fast Track would effectively allow the executive branch to make this agreement with other nations, effectively delegating <clears throat> in an unlawful way Congress's power under Article 1, Section 8. Congress has the power and the exclusive power to <coughs> regulate uh, commerce. And, and, and Congress should not be engaged in making such an unconstitutional exclusive delegation to the President of the United States. Finally, there is the threat of the secrecy of this agreement. No democratic nation should engage in passing a trade agreement like this without the light of day. And we all know why there is not any light on this agreement. The reason why is because if there was going to be a, a series of debates and hearings in the United States Congress, if we allow open and transparent process over this debate over TPP, the people would understand what a threat this is to our democracy and to our nation, to our vision of what we are as a country. And that is why we as citizens who care about our democracy must rise up and demand 
that fast track be voted down, the TPP be voted down. If Congress wants to stand up for democracy, it has to vote no on TPP and fast track. Climate Action Now, Western Mass 350, uh, joins, the environment, joins with environmental organizations throughout the world in condemning the fast track of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a massive trade deal being worked out in secrecy that will ben benefit multinational corporations at the expense of jobs, workers' rights, uh, our health, and the environment. Specifically vis-a-vis -vis the environment, like NAFTA before it, the TPP would allow foreign corporations to sue governments directly for unlimited cash compensation over almost any environmental or public health law that the corporation alleges is hurting or will hurt its ability to profit. That means that environmental and public health laws in this country and in other countries are at risk if ExxonMobil or Sony finds that they prevent maximizing gain. In a process settled by secret tribunals, like John said, outside the public eye. This is no joke, although it should be. To date, corporations such as ExxonMobil and Chevron have launched almost 600 cases against nearly 100 governments. Governments around the world have paid $3.6 billion to foreign corporations in investor state disputes under existing U.S. trade and investment deals, over 85% of which has been handed to corporations attacking oil, mining, gas, and other environmental and natural resource policies. And suits, or just threats of suits, have prevented these companies from paying the environmental damages to local nations that their actions, to local people that their actions have caused. And to adequately combat climate change, those rules must not just be left intact, they must be strengthened and deepened worldwide. 80% of the fossil fuels now in the ground must be left in the ground, not opened up by means, means of free trade agreements to corporate exploitation. Um, specifically in the United States, the TPP would facilitate the export of liquid, liquefied natural gas by requiring, requiring the U.S. Department of Energy to automatically approve all natural gas exports to TPP countries without the careful study and nece necessary to safeguard the American public. This would mean an increase in hydraulic fracturing, the dirty and violent process that dislodges gas deposits from shale rock formations while polluting the surrounding water and air. Increased natural gas export would mean increased electricity prices and further the use of polluting coal as natural gas prices necessarily rise. Fast track TPP is a race to the bottom for the Pacific Rim. It means gutting of environmental regulations that have meant the cleaning of our air and water and denying us the tools needed to combat climate change, which threatens us all. So Move On um, has been involved with a coalition for at least two years now working on trying to prevent fast track and the passage of TPP and um, progressive Democrats of America have been involved, many of the unions have been involved, they've had uh, weekly calls for like two years at least uh, working on this. And So that's one of Move On's interests. Move On has also been working to try and get GMOs labeled and that is my particular interest. Um, I'm also on the steering committee of Mass Right to Know GMOs. We're pushing hard for a bill uh, in the state to label GMOs. Well, if TPP passes, kiss that goodbye. Mm -hmm. Kiss goodbye any ability to regulate pesticides mm -hmm. or herbicides, mm -hmm. both of which are destroying the soil in this planet. 
We will not be able to raise a crop in another generation if we continue to abuse the, the planet the way we are. So for me, <laughs> this is like, this trade I agreement is like it. spelling the end of life mm -hmm. fairly soon. So we really have to try and stop it. Uh, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm not sanguine that we can because of the amount of big money, but we certainly have to try. It's a very, very bad thing. Um, so just to introduce myself again, I'm Dan Justice with the National AFL-CIO. Um, I, I don't want to, I think Brian really did a good job of covering our points in terms of uh, where labor stands on this particular deal. Uh, just a couple notes I wanted to uh, drive home for folks in terms of, uh, I think there's been a lot of discussion about income inequality and we all know how, you know, uh, we're in what's what's supposedly called a, an economic recovery, but we know most of the benefits of that, uh, that recovery has gone to the top and very little has really trickled down to the bottom to workers. Um, the way the National AFL-CIO feels about this and, and, and unions across the country is this is a, this is a number one contributor to income, income inequality and the ability for workers mm -hmm. to, to raise their wages. Um, we know when the passage of NAFTA happened, um, you know, we could sort of see the writing on the wall, mm -hmm. uh, but there, we didn't really have a lot of data back then, but you know, the evidence is clear. Trade bill after trade bill after trade bill. We see where workers here in, in the United States and across uh, uh, all over the world has set in motion a race to the bottom for all workers. Uh, what we need to do is really take a look at how we approach our trade policy. Uh, President Trump has said we, gotta, we have to take our, the way we approach trade out from the back rooms and shine some light on these negotiations. There has to be openness and it's clearly pointed out uh, by, by my friends and Marks over here. Uh, clearly, uh, it, you know, this is the only interests that are being represented in those rooms are the are the interest of of global businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no in, uh, there's uh, there's no workers sitting at that table. There's no representatives from labor in there. Uh, you know, trying to make sure that we have adequate protections for workers and the environment and consumers. Uh, so we need a new approach, and um, uh, really. You know, having heard everybody, that's really all I, I have to add. I, I appreciate everybody's remarks today. And uh, I just want to leave out some hope here uh, because um, I was stating to my friends earlier is that all of our collective action across the country is having an impact on Congress. The, the leadership in Congress can feel they're taking on water uh, on this issue. Uh, support is eroding and that all of our collective action is clearly having an impact. They're now trying to fast track, fast track, okay? <laughs> because they know this is their only chance. This is their only chance for them to be able to pass this. So I just want to throw out hope. Mm -hmm. uh, the one thing we have now is probably a nine-day window. There's no time anymore for us to sit around and, uh, you know, I mean, frankly, we're, we're putting out postcards. The window's closing really quickly. I'm getting mail. But what I would recommend we do is that uh, in any meetings, uh, our family, our friends, any gatherings. Explain to them what fast track in the TPP is and what the effects that it's had on workers, the environment, consumers. Uh, and ask them, to, it's a two minute call. You can literally Google Congressman Neal's office, uh, his Washington office is the most effective place to send your message. And, and call his office and leave a message. Uh, I can assure you they are taking notes on how many calls they're getting in on this right now. Uh, so uh, we have hope. Workers need a victory. The environment needs a victory. We can, we can defeat Fast Track and the TPP. We just need to take action, and the time is now. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm a letter carrier, but and we can get the mail overnight, but not to D.C. So 202-225, tell me if I'm wrong, 5601. That's directly to Neil's office? That's yeah. the D.C. office. Yeah, and that's the best number to call right now. Okay, repeat that, John. 202-225-5601. If possible, Hockey, we could add it as a graphic at the end of the video. Um, you may have questions for the panel, or you may have comments you want to make, or you may have questions after you hear some comments. So let's have a, a, a bit of discussion. Um, about this and then 
can we talk about getting this material out to our various groups? The material is all all purpose. You know, we have friends from Connecticut up. This is not just a Richie Neal approach here. Take whatever you need on your way out. But um, keep in mind that we do in Massachusetts have this these two heavy lifts. Out west we have Richie Neal, and out east we have Seth Moulton. Do we have? Is it in Spanish? The postcards, I doubt it right now. Uh, just looking at the boxes, I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, but also we have a whole distribution point that Marty might be able to help with. So anyway, the, um, uh, maybe when we look, when we dig, I actually have, I just opened those boxes this morning. So the, any questions for the panel to start with that and then also comment? Talked about where, uh, Small farmers could be at risk because this trade deal could actually force them to stop doing certain things because they, they would be denying corporations profits in some fashion. Could you speak more to that, please? Okay, um, so essentially, um, one of the main concerns is that local preference um, policies, so things like farm to school programs or citywide um, local procurement policies, um, could be considered barriers to trade. Um, and anything that's considered a barrier to trade under international free trade agreements um, are then uh, like cities, yeah, cities, states, or countries who have these kinds of policies can be sued under this international tribunal court system that they spoke about. Um, and so local procurement policies are directly at risk um, and that directly impacts small farmers. Um, so that's one of the main concerns um, facing small farms. And um, the other one being um, what we spoke about with um, an influx of um, cheaper imports from other countries um, that makes it more difficult um, for small farmers to um, hold themselves up in this economy. Being at risk by this TTP, Absolutely. could it be killed or could it be damaged uh, in ways that we don't know about yet because if, uh, the small farm movement may be taking root in some part of the United States and people are look, buying locally and suddenly someone's getting sued because someone from the corporation realizes they're losing profits mm -hmm. to local farmers who are selling to local people, mm -hmm. and they don't like that. And uh, I, I guess that's an enormously troubling concept to me, but I guess that sounds like that's what you're talking about here. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the, the actual by local movement could be at risk for this. Yeah. Okay. Previous trade policy that a lot of these countries already have, you know, like agreements with the U.S. that you know there will be fewer tariffs and fewer barriers to trade, and so it, you know, it, it really. I don't know if anyone can speak to the fact that you know that, that that even like the the idea of like huge tariffs preventing trade. That's not really what this is about. It's more about the the kind of corporations having that tribunal having that you know equal say of corporations. I was just going to say, uh, I, would, I would say you're spot on in the sense that, you know, in terms of the way um, the American workers feel about this, I mean, we have the most productive workers in the world, okay? <laughs> in fact, production of workers has gone up over the last, you can see how American workers' productivity has gone like this, while their wages have gone like this. This, this pack, though, which includes 12 countries, it's a major pack. Uh, it will take on like 40% of the GDP. It, it's, it's a huge number. I've got to look it up. But it's a massive trade pack that has huge ramifications uh, for us here and around the world. Um, you know, to touch on this world court, uh, really this is not the way uh, we should be approaching our trade where we have this little court that can override uh, a country's sovereignty in terms of ways that we can deal and address problems. Uh, it takes us right. It takes it right out of the hands of our governments and puts it right in the hands of uh, of, of corporations. So uh, it's it's a huge problem. We have to again. Uh, I'll reiterate. We have to figure out a new approach to our trade policy. Clearly, this isn't working. Uh, so uh, I don't. I'm not really sure why we're having so much debate about this in Congress because there's so much data on it. Uh, but clearly, we, we understand how Washington works, and we know who butters their bread and fills their coffers with money. And it's it's certainly uh, uh, labor's part of that. Uh, but we're really a small fish uh, when it comes to uh, 
the corporate uh, uh, pay, uh, payrolls, uh, money that's flowing into <coughs> our, our congressmen, our, our Congre members of Congress uh, uh, campaign accounts. So uh, that's another issue altogether, campaign finance. But uh, would you like to touch that? Well, touch yeah, I mean, I, I would just add, yeah. you know, uh, beyond, beyond <coughs> that, the from what Dan said, the fact is, is that this agreement, if it's put into effect, would empower 9,000 plus foreign corporations to come into the United States and effectively bring these investor state tribunal claims uh, and, and either wipe out existing regulations that we have or force us as taxpayers to pay literally billions of dollars to these foreign firms because their so-called future profits are being undermined by our environmental laws, our health care laws, our worker safety <coughs> laws, you know, our laws protecting our communities. So, you know, this is not an American uh, way to go. If we're, if, if for all those members of Congress who want to say they're out to protect the United States of America, you know, when it comes to national security or whatever it is, this is a deeply serious threat to the United States of America, to our laws, to our sovereignty. And it's going to be the same kind of threat to sovereign nations around the world. But we don't even have to go there if we want to deal with the very fact that when it comes to our democracy and the way we uh, pass and enact laws, those laws are now completely subject to attack by these foreign businesses that claim that their profits in doing business with uh, you know, the United States are now at risk. If we didn't join in the TPP, we would be out of the global, global people who make decisions about trade and stuff. And he said that China would take over. And I don't understand how how are not being involved the TPP could make it so that we don't have say in trade global trade agreements. I mean, why did you say that? Why did you say that? Well, uh, yes, uh, you know, uh, I think every president since Richard Nixon has sought to have this authority um, to just go be, be able to be the person to sit at the table and make all the decisions around our, our trade policy. Um, you know, it's not really complicated. Uh, they, they'll try to tell you this is complicated and this is the way we need to approach this. Um, Labor's position is, and President Trump has clearly stated, uh, we are ready to compete. Uh, American workers is, are as good and productive as anybody, and, um, but this is the wrong approach. We, uh, we, we need to change the way we do our, our, our trade deals. And I would say that we heard the same argument when NAFTA was passed, mm -hmm. when the WTO was passed, mm -hmm. and PNTR was passed. Mm -hmm. And what has the result been? So um, clearly, if we continue to move down the same course we've been moving, uh, we can't expect a different result. Um, I don't know if uh, I, I would say that's the best I could do in answering your yeah. question, but it's not complicated. They'll try to tell you it is, but it really isn't. It, it, the bottom line, less jobs, lower mm -hmm. wages. That's... Mm -hmm. yeah. The most unnerving thing to me about this whole thing, and it's been the case with NAFTA and with uh, CAFTA and with every trade uh, debate that we've had, is that we don't really have uh, good control of our own narrative and we let the other guys define our position for us. Um, starting with the President of the United States right on down, everyone who argues against our position frames us as wanting to wall off the United States economy and that we're opposed to trading with other nations and nothing could be further from the truth. This is a bad deal and it stinks from top to bottom, but we end up on the defensive trying, you know, uh, because we let everybody define our, our position for us. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm not sure what you do about that. I, I'm really not because I, 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 with everything that's gone on and all the effort that's gone into this over such a long period of time, our position, and I'm not just speaking for the labor movement, but I think of, uh, of uh, uh, almost everybody that has uh, difficult problems with, with this uh, uh, current trade deal, as with the past ones, uh, gets put into this little box of being uh, opposed to trade generally. We've got to figure out a better, a better message. We really do. Uh, lastly, you know, on uh, that later <coughs> point about why is Obama claiming that we'll be out of the loop on trade? I, I think that assumes something that 
is happening slowly, but is a long way from getting there. What gives us the trump card, if we wanted to play it, uh, is that we've got the largest market in the world, and it's access to our market that's Great. really yeah. what's the key to this. Mm -hmm. China's market is growing, and, and at some day, just based on population, may well eclipse us, but not until they do a hell of a lot more to, to raise income, and uh, the, the consuming class in China is very small, growing, but growing very slowly. But, you know, they're looking 50 years down the road and making an argument about a world that doesn't exist now in defense of, of what is a bad deal for us today. About the current uh, process in Congress, and my understanding was that the legislation has been introduced into the Senate currently, and that it would have to come out of the Senate before uh, the House. I, so I just wanted to know if we should also be, or you know, even targeting senators, regardless of where we think they stand at this point, and then these the, the folks that have not sure. signed on or come out from sure. their so, position. Okay. Excellent. That's a good question, and I appreciate you asking it. Um, there is no rule on who goes first. Um, I think proponents' strategy on this uh, initially was to have it go first in the Senate because they feel like they have the votes and it's going to pass there to build momentum going into the House. Uh, but um, it's now, uh, even many senators now, with, again, as I pointed out, a lot of the great collective work we've done across the country, uh, even there's many senators now that are wavering. Uh, uh, I think they still have the votes in the Senate, but there is no rule on who goes first. It's more on leaderships uh, thinking through strategically how they're going to get this passed. So. Um, you know, I actually hope it goes first in the House because I'm feeling much better over on the House side than I am, I am on the Senate. But, uh, yeah, no rules on who goes first on this. One of the things that horrifies me as much as Fast Track and TPP is the overwhelming lack of knowledge about this on the part of so many people yeah. in, the general, in the general public. Um, and a while ago, I know that there was a, a push to encourage everybody to get more coverage about these issues into all of our local newspapers. I think we need to revive that push. Um, it may be too late at this point to cover the fast track part of this, but people are still going to need a lot of information about TPP, regardless of what happens now. Sure. Um, when I get that blank stare, you know, can I, can I talk to you about the TPP, or do you know about the TPP? Um, I'm amazed at how many people have no idea about what we all know about in this room. Sure. So it's going to take more than us mm -hmm. to get the word out. The postcards are great, and, and, and the sharing that we do is fine, but we need to hold the media responsible, too. I, I completely agree. Uh, remember, we have a media that's controlled by, what, like five corporations? <laughs> so, oh so they sort of control. <laughs> yeah. sure. That's why we haven't heard much on, on this. Uh, but uh, when you actually, I don't have the polling data with me, but when you actually, you know, when polling is done in the, on trade, it's not very popular. Uh, people have felt the effects of bad trade deals. Uh, I used to work at a factory that was closed uh, due to, uh, a, you know, they make, I used to work at a, uh, we used to extrude plastic when we made the bristles for Oral-V toothbrushes and Hoover vacuum cleaners, anything you used to brush for. Uh, we produced it. Uh, it was a, those were good paying jobs. I raised a family on it. Uh, I believe that stuff's made in China now. So um, uh, they're not popular. And uh, I know they're not popular with all my former co workers who no longer work there. So, and uh, there's communities all over the country uh, where communities have been devastated by a major employer picking up, rooting up, and right. leaving. So, uh, anyways, I don't want to, anybody else want to comment? I don't mean to take up the airspace here. Well, I, I would just say on holding the media accountable, I completely agree. And I think that, you know, in addition to calling uh, Congressman Neal's office and uh, Senator's offices, we, we ought to call the media. You know, we ought to call the local papers and ask, why did they show up at this important press conference? And when are they going to cover this in the next several days? And where is going to be the voices of opposition? And, you know, letters to the editor uh, also matter, too, and calling into radio shows matters. I, I agree completely they need to be held accountable, and the way to do that is to uh, publicly pressure them. Remember, when we talk to our legislators, is to let them know that we represent more than one group. In other words, I think it's very easy for, easy for legislators and the media to say, oh, labor just cares about their jobs. 
oh, those environmental people just care about this. Oh, whoever heard of them, you know, they are some splinter group. Well, no. You know, we're the local folks. And I think that the more we make people aware that we care about this from different perspectives, the more likely um, some of our legislators are to stop and go, oh, I guess maybe I should think about this. And I don't know if that alone, that approach alone has anything to do with our making progress. But I'm just really tired of um, the media and Congress and everyone else trying to put me in a box. And going over these types of meetings with different organizations and each time that we have to criticize these movements since the beginning of the industrialization of this country. Mm -hmm. We always seem to start too late in getting the information out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there some way that we can, ahead of time, yeah. start getting the information out? Because now we're pushing for a shortage of time that we have to do something, have to do sure. something. And that's when we start running into problems and trying to get the uh, thing out uh, completely. Sure. And of course, I guess my good friend used to say, uh, the business of America is business. Calvin Coolidge. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's tough because this thing has been snowballing and snowballing, and the cooperation are now becoming more of our government mm -hmm. than our government is. Mm -hmm. So we have a problem in that situation. But then again, how much different are their being than what they used to be because they do have the money. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that's, I guess, is the most uh, powerful thing. So how do we stop the money? How do we stop? Uh, what well, I know it's just through each citizen trying to do something. Yeah. But how do you slow that thing down? Because after this, it will be something else. There has been a large group of people working on getting the word out for over two years. Mm -hmm. They've organized uh, teach-ins and rallies. Haven't been able to get the press to cover them. <clears throat> I mean, just uh, almost total, total uh, ignoring on the part of the press. Just not showing up, not covering, no matter what people do. And there are a limited number of people who can get their heads around <laughs> this thing called TPP, who were even interested in it. It's been, you know, I don't know how to change the citizenry, to get the citizenry to pay more attention to what's going on. I don't know. You know I mean, before I, the country to be honest with gone. you, I just happened to, in fact, I came for something entirely different. And I just happened to see the name, and he explained to me about the uh, press conference, yeah. and I'm here now, but I've never... Really don't you want to add the fact that TP, the fast track has been stopped before? This is not yeah. like we haven't won oh, yeah. against. Mm -hmm. right. Right. Well, we have. Uh, I think I believe back in 1998, I remember a campaign where we defeated fast track. Um, it, it can be done. Uh, this right. isn't, uh, uh, I, you know, as I said earlier, there's hope on this, and this, I think, um, I'm. Uh, I was telling John that sometimes I can be naively optimistic, but I really do feel good that if we do our jobs here at home. If uh, Congressman Neal hears from you, Congressman Moulton, and I would encourage you to call Senator Warren. She's with us, but thank her. You know, uh, ask Gary uh, Phil. Yeah. Well, we, yeah. somebody uh, got a waffling <laughs> reply from Senator Markey. <coughs> now, I think it's. Yeah. I think we lose in the Senate, no yeah. matter what we do with Markey. Yeah. We win in the House if we turn if we make sure that people like Neal <coughs> correctly. So. Our job here, and e even if you're not in Neil's district, um, or our job in Massachusetts would be Neil and Moulton, and I think we, this Labor Council, is taking responsibility for Neil, but it includes people who, who don't get to vote for him, who get to vote for someone who's with us, Jim McGovern. What I would hope, it was possible during this week of activism, and this day of activism around the world, it was possible uh, almost for a little window of uh, having Jim McGovern come out in a clear uh, major way uh, that might maybe rub off on Neil. It didn't happen, but those of you who do vote for McGovern or potentially could register and vote for McGovern, someone who, who's a student at UMass, for instance, may still register back home, but they might 
want to tell him uh, I could be your constituent. McGovern could be uh, more of the leader of the delegation on this. Neil is the senior of the delegation, but McGovern could be the leader on that. So there's a message there, even if he's already on our side. Stand up, be the leader. Neil, we're, we've given up on him being a leader. He's a vote. He's a battle. Yeah. Particular, no. If I so could add, just say on Neil that, yeah. that you know his ostensive excuse for uh, for not committing on this mm -hmm. has been his his desire to be in there and see and uh, all right. Well, look, the window's closing on that, right? Right. It's this done. thing is going to hit the floor in ten days, you think? And I think if that needs sure. to be, yeah. if, if we're calling Richie Neal's office, I think what we need to be saying to him is the time for having access to, the, to what's going on is over. And the, the, the deal is pretty much done and it's ready to hit the floor. Now's the time to commit. Now, I don't know what he's going to say, mm -hmm. but I want to know where he's going to stand before he votes. And I think uh, as his constituents, uh, we should continue to press him to do that. So one thing that if you signed up on the, uh, the, the sheet that went around, you could give us your email, we will give you um, the link. We'll send out both the phone number and the link to his, his um, constituent uh, comment card online. Um, and then also we'll have the postcards. And you can double, triple dip here. You can message him in any way you can imagine. Um, we won't give out his home phone number just yet. But, uh, <laughs> just yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's always that possibility. But in any case, uh, he's being given cover now, I understand, by the Springfield Republican. Has anyone seen their editorial? I yeah, was told I about it. Well, it was there? a pro TPP. Or is it pro fast track or pro TV? Both. Both. Editorial in the Springfield Republican. So that's giving him cover, whereas he's telling people uh, through his aides, he's telling people who lobby him, well, he's going to vote correctly on fast track. He always votes correctly on fast track, right. which, is, which is actually pretty much true. So fast track then is defeated, that's that scenario. What will be resurrected is some kind of congressional way of dealing with TPP. They will want to say, they'll start amending it, they'll start, they'll be dealing with telling the president what to negotiate, things that maybe are still open for negotiation. Now at that point, that's where the power of money comes right back in. So the rich are prepared for either direction. They're prepared to win on fast track, and if they lose on fast track, they're prepared to still write that trade agreement. Right. So there's where we're pretty much convinced by words that came out of Richie's own mouth, that he will vote for TPP. So then we are, our job is not over when we win. If we win on fast track, our job is not over. No, I absolutely agree with you. Based on the meeting that we had with him, or with his aides, mm -hmm. what, a year ago? Yeah, about a year ago. You know, and they were saying, well, he's a free trader. He's always voted for free trade agreements. So yeah. I think that's So even if you're not in the district, please, when you get the email with his phone number, or you got it today, take it on the way out if you didn't get it. Um, it'll be sitting here on this piece of paper both the local office, the Springfield office, and the D.C. office. Um, and then we'll send this out. We'll send you also a link to writing a letter to the editor. And those have been made very easy by Public Citizen now. Uh, actually, uh, a number of groups have set these, these places up online. If you want to get a jump on this, you just Google uh, something like uh, Communication Workers of America or... or uh, PDA has a... PDA has one. Um, where you write your letter online and then they take care of delivering it yeah. to the papers in your uh, media area, which pretty much there's only one, but you know, potentially it could be many. And you were going to say something. I don't know if you're facing the same thing here in Massachusetts, but there are um, at least two legislators in Connecticut who um, are publicly saying that they can't take a stand on fast track until they know that there's some sort of fast track legislation that will be acceptable. Um, and I think the message that we have to ha hound yeah. on is no fast track yeah. is acceptable. Right. None. Um, yeah. and, and so I don't know what you're hearing from the folks here in Massachusetts, but in Connecticut, it's frustrating to the max. Well, I mean, I'm well, I'm a member of the House Ways Means Committee. Um, you know, I really need to keep a sort of an objective profile so that I can be a player at the table to negotiate and leverage a better deal. And every time I hear that, it's just like, that means nothing to me because 
fast track is fast track. I don't know how you fine tune giving the president complete authority and you come back with still an up or down vote, period. Um, so at the end of the day, I could, I could never quite understand Congressman Neal's um, position. Uh, but uh, he clearly wants to be a player. Uh, uh, I just hope he's advocating for us. So uh, he needs to hear from us. I would think this whole thing can come unraveled in yeah. the House. Yeah. Uh, and, and it might be surprising where we find our first friends in that in, in that fight. But we'll be, we'll be <laughs> strange we have strange bedfellows there yeah. already. Yeah, like yeah. The, the, the Tea Party. party. Uh, there's many Tea Party yeah. uh, where they might not have too many concerns about workers' rights, but they do have concerns about sovereignty. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, and plus. Uh, anything that the president proposes and they have a knee-jerk opposition so in this particular case the dynamics are working in our favor in terms of uh, girls from many one right <laughs> <laughs> one thing that um, a number of groups have been advocating is that you don't just call your legislative once you call them in washington you call them every day you're not paying that close attention they're, they're making a hash mark Another call, another call, another call. They're, they're not writing down everybody's names. So just keep calling them. Goodbye. It's a different name. Excellent. And on that note, I just wanted to say uh, we're going to have a, a, on Tuesday, because Monday's a holiday in Boston, or I don't know if it's a holiday out here, Patriots yeah, Day. But, yeah, yeah. Stay yeah. Um, Okay, so, but Tuesday, we're, I'm, I'm going to try to pull together and facilitate a call where we try to schedule a couple phone banks. I was explaining we have technology where we can actually call constituents. Um, and ask them, uh, you know, explain a little, give them a little background on what's going on in the in the in the, in the Congress in terms of we're on fast track and the TPP, and uh, most people are more than willing to uh, make that call. You just call them, you say okay, and and with technology, it's on a computer. It's very simple. If I can figure it out, anybody in this room can, uh, and you can literally directly connect them through to uh, Neil's office. So. Um, I think at this point, we're running out of time. I said uh, I think we still have time to get some mail out, but pretty soon it's going to come down to just uh, figuring out phones. So please, John, uh, and I know the Pioneer Valley Labor Council will be getting the word out, but we're going to schedule uh, a couple phone banks, and we really need to fill those phone banks out. We've got to, get, we've got to make sure that, people are, uh, that Neil knows that people back home are paying attention. So.